written down centuries ago, the greatest story ever told. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, a story about a beautiful and eternal creator, complete in himself, but so full of love that he made creatures to enjoy relationships with him. So God created human beings in his own image. This infinite being took eternity and wove it into tangible strands of earth. But his creation rebelled. Humans didn't think they needed him and tried to go their own way, disrupting the original design of joyful unity with their creator. In spite of everything, God has never stopped fighting for reunion and restoration. The wages of sin is death, but he knew the way to heal our fractured relationship, for this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his very best. He gave his son, Jesus, to save the world from its sins. Now, his children, shameless and forgiven, free, loosened from the bonds of sin. The hero of all heroes, the greatest love story ever told. All right, good morning, Rescue House Church. I hope you're doing well. I love this moment where we just get to welcome those that are watching in online from all over uh, the nation. Can we just welcome those in that are watching our online, our online family? We welcome you in today. Uh, it's pretty cool. We've got our leaders. I don't mean to call you out, but our leaders from Rescue House North are here today, Patty and Dave Fielding. So when we talk about our Massachusetts crew up there, our Rescue House North, we might as well just call them our Rescue House North Campus, right? Uh, they are real people, and every now and then they make it in, and so we're glad that you're here. And we are just thankful for your leadership. We're thankful for how you're spreading the message of Jesus, how you're getting that group together, and how you watch every single week. Uh, we're just grateful to call you family, and we love you. So I didn't mean to call you out. I just want to say, recognize that we love you guys. So Massachusetts crew, your leaders are here today in person, and don't you just love being in the room, somebody? You know, love being in the room uh, with the Holy Spirit moving and the worship. Our worship team did a phenomenal job this morning. Just uh, praise paves the way for us to really hear the word of God. You know, we come in with some junk sometimes. We come in with some mistakes. And it's amazing how Jesus can get a hold of our heart, uh, set our hearts to be good ground for the seed that's going to be thrown out so that it doesn't go in one area out the other. really seeps deep into our hearts. That's our prayer each and every week. Before I get into the message today, though, uh, I want you to know that this summer, our, our, our students, 6th grade through 12th grade, are going to camp. And one of our legacy lanes here at Rescue House Church is the next generation. We truly believe that we don't just have a student ministry, we are a student ministry, okay? Like if all we do is come in and worship Jesus and we learn a little bit about his word and we do not pass the baton of the message of Jesus off to the next generation, we have failed, Okay, and, and, and really, the gospel is really only one generation away from being extinct if we as a church don't believe in the next generation. And we're not going to be a church that says, well, they, they weren't raised like we were raised and this and that. We're not going to criticize the next generation. Come on, we're going to meet them where they are and share the love of Jesus with them. And we're going to pass the baton of the church and the gospel to them. And so one of the ways that we do that is we take them to camp every single year at Crowder's Ridge. So if you've got a, a student, 6th grade through 12th grade, you need to get them in the presence of God. They need to get away for a week if they can. Just It, it changed my life. Camp changed my life, and I want that for your student. Now, here's the deal, church. Is some, there, there's a lot of families here who might have multiple children, or maybe they have you know, three children. Camp registration is $330 per person, per kid, okay? And usually, you know, if you got one kid, you know, you normally can swing that. But from, for some of our families, it might be $1,000 to send all three of their kids to camp this summer, and that's really hard and really tough. And so here's what I'm calling on, is maybe there are some empty nesters in the room today. Uh, there's some people with some resources that above and beyond your tithe, 
you would want to support and sponsor a child to go to camp. It's $330. You can sponsor one child, two children. You can do whatever you want to do there. Uh, but if that's on your heart today, I just want to give you the opportunity to be obedient to that. Um, and I want you to see our student pastor, uh, Jesse. I don't think she's in the room right now, but uh, I want you to find her at the Rise Up banner, and uh, she'll tell you how you can sponsor a child. Let, let's get these kids to camp. Let's help these families, and let's uh, pass the baton of the church to the next generation. Every year, you guys step up and do a really good job of that. So just pray about that and, and see how God would lead you. Right now, we're in a series called The Year of the Bible, and we have deemed 2022 uh, for us, the year of the Bible. And we as a church, we're reading the Bible together every day for 15 minutes. And we want to read through the Bible in a year. And I love it. I'm excited about it because what we're doing is uh, we're reading about God. We're finding Jesus. We're seeing who God is in light of who we are. And so the Bible is like a mirror. We look into the mirror and we see some things that we need to fix, some things that we need to touch up on, and we can make those changes. At the same time, we're developing a relationship with God as we're learning more about Jesus and finding him in every single page. And so I love this Bible. It's not just the Bible, though. It's the Holy Bible. Can I get an amen, somebody, right? So it's like set apart. It's holy. It's special. This book right here is the most uh, translated book ever. It's the most read book ever. It's the most sold book ever. And it's the most important book we will ever read. That's what Bible means. It just simply means the word book or books. And I just believe today that as you hear the news and you hear the rumblings in the, the, the college professor classrooms, the Bible is under attack. And so over the next couple of weeks, we want to take an opportunity to teach you how to defend the Bible. We want to let you know it's trustworthy, it's true, and, there re and this really is the word of God, a word from heaven. It's reliable and it can be trusted. So don't miss the next couple of weeks, okay? But today what I want to do is give you a flyby of the Bible. Here's the message title for today is the Bible from 30,000 feet. So listen, I, I've been praying all week long that this would not be boring to you. As I put my teacher hat on today, I'm not really going to preach very much, but I'm going to equip you uh, because I get a ton of questions about the Bible. Why do we have all the different translations? Where do we start? Why are some of the words red in the Bible and some of them are black? What, what, you know, how, do we, how can we test it? How can we trust it? I get a lot of questions like that. So over the next, this week and next week, I'm really going to dive into that. And this is something you need to have in your arsenal to be able to defend it when somebody asks you questions instead of you saying, well, I don't know, I just kind of believe it, you know? Like there are some things that I want to instill in you and equip you. And so I really want you to lean into uh, this classroom today. I want to start out with a verse. But before I start out with this verse, does anybody remember our verse from last week? Anybody? Raise your hand if you remember our verse from last week. All right, I got like a couple people. Maybe we can try to do it together. All right, we're going to try to, we memorize the verse, and here it is. Let's try it. One, two, three. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. All right, not bad, not bad. Give yourselves a hand. That's not bad. It's been a week. See how you forget stuff, right? You forgot it by Monday, but I'm helping you. So you got you to gotta lean into it more. Here's today's verse that I want to memorize. It's Colossians 3.16. We'll do the same thing. We'll put it on the screen. We'll read it through twice. I'll take it away, and then we will read it. Here we go, Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. All right, now I need you to use your voice, okay? That's like your quiet voice, your whispering voice. I need somebody to wake up in this house, okay? All right, here we go with your, not your loud voice, but just your firm voice. Here we go. One, two, three. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3, 16. All right, here we go. Take it away. All right. You, got, you think you got it? I'm not going to help you. I'm going to let you do it. One, two, three. Hey, all right, all right. I love it. I love it. Now, you got to understand, that's our verse for today. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now, the first word there is you got to let it, right? You, you have to let the word of God, you got to let Christ dwell in you richly. So there is, uh, you know, a power that is available to us, but you got to let it. And I'm telling you, if you will let the word of God dwell inside of you richly, hide it away in your heart, 
you will discover who God made you to be. And so over the next, you know, this series, I want to help you get the Bible inside of you at the deepest level. I've got an illustration of uh, Becca, uh, my friend, wants to come out and help me. There you go. <laughs> um, so, hey, give Becca a round of applause, everybody. Our, she, she does so much for us. She's a worship leader, graphic design artist, small group leader. She does it all. Okay, so this, it, w- this water right here represents your life, all right? And this uh, tea bag represents the word of God. Now, some of you are coming to church every week, and you're kind of allowing the word of God to dip into your life, right? But it's just like one dip a week. And I, I wouldn't call that, you know, you can see a little bit of a difference there, but I wouldn't call that tea yet, right? And so I just want you to know it's not enough for you just to come and listen to the word every single week. It's not enough. You, can, you can't just eat once a week, <laughs> right? Come on, you've got to continually allow the word of God to be dipped inside of you, to dwell inside of you richly, right? And so you've got to keep allowing the word of God to take dips into your life, and eventually, dip after dip after dip, you're going to have tea. So here's what I want to do, is I want to help you Go a little bit deeper by allowing the word of God to take dips in your life, okay? So number one, we want to go a little bit deeper. We want to allow the word of God to dip into our life. Number one, you got to get a translation that you like and that you can understand. You've got to get a translation that you can understand. I get asked often, what's up with all the translations? Why do you use certain translations or the occasional If you don't use King James Version, you're a false teacher. Like, I get that, okay? Like, there are some people who revere the King James Version, uh, and I revere it as well. Like, I think it's a good translation. Uh, Just for me, I think some people revere it too much where it's like, if you use any other translation, you're a false teacher, you're going to hell, and and they, they revere it a little bit too much. And so that's not where we stand as a church, okay? We have to understand that the Bible wasn't written in English, Okay, it was written, the the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. Okay, and so we had to, in order for us English speaking people to be able to read the Bible, it had to be translated into English. Now, the problem is, a lot of times we don't have an English word that accurately represents, and so sometimes we have to tease it out, and sometimes we get different translations. Now, some people step up and say, well, you know, one of the lies that the devil likes to spread is that the translations have been diluted one after the other. And that would be true if it's like, you know, the King James Version was, you know, um, you know, translated and then a Bible translated from the King James Version and then another version, you know, translated from that version and that version and so on and so on. But that's not how the Bible is translated. All the translations that we have in English are across the board go to the original manuscripts. Does that make sense? So each, by, each translation is from the original manuscripts. It's not one right after the other, and so it's not diluted, and, and these transcriptors are going back to the original manuscripts. Now, we have different translations, but they all say the same things, really. They do. When you read them and you study them, there are dozens of dozens of English translations for us to read, and it's because you are blessed, because God has had his hand of favor on us in this country. There, I, you got to understand, there are 3,752 languages that do not have the word of God in their original language. Can you imagine that? 3,752 languages. So there's people out there who don't even have the word of God yet in their own tongue and their own language, and you get a chance not only to have it in your language, but to have it in a way that you can understand. And Lauren and I, we are passionate about helping people understand the Bible, which is why we as a church support what is called the Bible Project. Their mission, their nonprofit, their mission is to help people understand the Bible from beginning to end. Now, the translations actually fall into three categories. So if you're a note taker, write this down. The first one is in the form of 
formal equivalency, okay? Or some people call it exact equivalency. This is where these versions are translated word for word, all right? This is the King James Version was recorded word for word, and it was written in 1611. But the problem is the last several hundred years, the word didn't change, but our grammar changed. Like how we communicated, how we talked changed. And so formal equivalency translates word for word. This is King James Version. The new King James Version, which is the King James Version just without the these and the thous, right? And and, uh, the New American Standard Bible and the ESV. Uh, So that's formal equivalency, word for word from the original manuscripts. Functional equivalency is the second option. These are translations like the New Living Translation, the, the Good News Translation, the NIV, And these are not word-for-word translations. They're thought-for-thought. So what they did was they took a verse, and they took the meaning of that verse and the thought of that verse, and they translated it by verse. So not word-for-word, but thought-for-thought. That is functional equivalency. And if accuracy is your thing, I'm telling you, I think the NIV is one of the most accurate translations because it's kind of in the middle of a formal and functional uh, equivalency. And so it does a really good job. And since 1987, the NIV has outsold all other translations by millions. And so that's why oftentimes I use uh, the NIV and I use the New Living Translation. Now, the third option that you have is not really a translation, and so we have to be careful about that. It's a paraphrase. These are paraphrased Bibles. This is like the Living Bible or the Message Version. In the last two decades, the Message Version uh, or paraphrase has been really popular. Now, these paraphrases, they're not trying to be translations. They're not trying to be functional or formal Bibles. They're just trying to put it in a way that people can understand. And they actually do not uh, translate from the original manuscripts. They took our English-speaking Bibles, and they translated from them to help us better understand them. And actually, the two authors of the Living Bible and the message actually just wrote them so that their children could understand them, and then they kind of became popular. So paraphrases for me, I don't uh, you know, consider just like the true word of God, but for me, they're like devotionals, and they're like secondary reads, okay? So sometimes I'll read something in the Bible. You ever read something, and you're like, I have no idea what that's saying, right? Well, sometimes you can go to the message in that uh, section, and it'll help you understand what that's saying. And so a lot of times I use the message in my study to help me understand so that I can put it on a level you can understand, okay? I normally don't preach from the message. Every now and then I'll sprinkle something in, but normally I'm preaching from the NIV or the NLT. Let me give you an example of the three different uh, equivalencies, okay? So the first example is from the NIV. This is 1 Corinthians 13, 4. You've probably heard this at a wedding somewhere, and here's what it says. It says, charity suffereth long, right? Like, we don't talk like that anymore, but the word charity there in the Greek is the word agape, which means unconditional godlike love, and that's the exact definition of agape. So the King James decided to use the word charity, and the word, and suffereth long, that's just one word, it just means patience, all right? And so they're, they're saying charity suffereth long, and is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, it's not puffeth up, right? Like it's like, you know, this is how the King James reads, and we do not really talk like that anymore. And so you hand this Bible to a 12-year-old, and they're trying to read that, charity suffer, like they're not going to understand it. They're not going to get it. And what good is it if they're reading it and they never understand it, and they never can develop a relationship with God because there's a language barrier there. So you get to the NIV, right? And it says this, love is patient. Same exact verse, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. And so you can see that same verse, a little bit more clear for this generation. Same exact thing, just different grammar. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 in the message version. Okay, so same verse. This is in the message version. This is the paraphrase. It says, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, 
doesn't have a swelled head. So you can see like the message got a little attitude to it, right? Like it like teases it, it teases it out a little bit. So I, again, the message paraphrase is not the true word of God, right? Like we don't revere it in that way, but it is a great devotional, a good secondary read to help us understand what God is trying to say. So that's one dip, right? Is is reading your Bible, getting a translation that you can understand. If you want to go a little bit deeper, you want another dip from the Bible, we talked about this last week, get a study Bible. Everybody at Rescue Us Church, even those watching online, you need a study Bible. You need a Bible that has commentary on the side that helps you understand what you read. And if you're serious about understanding the Bible, you'll get a study Bible. And I love how these Bibles have footnotes. They help you understand. Again, it helps the Bible to come alive. Some of our, the ones that we want to promote that we would encourage you to get is the Life Application Bible or the ESV Bible or for some of you business leaders, uh, the John Maxwell Study Bible is great for business people, leadership commentary uh, throughout the pages of Scripture. And so actually today we've got some of those Bibles on sale for you out in the middle of the atrium. If you, We've got a limited stock of them, but uh, you know, Actually, what they told me, they, they put a tile on the app. So if you have the app downloaded, there's study Bible resources on there that are links that will lead you to those three study Bibles. And you can purchase those on Amazon or you can purchase those uh, wherever those links lay. So we want you to get a study Bible. Um, and then the third dip is to get in a small group. So now I'm not just reading it. Now I'm not studying it. Now I'm in a circle and I'm discussing it. That's a deeper dip, right? And so you got to get into a small group uh, where you're growing spiritually. And together, it's iron sharpening iron, right? And you're growing together. And you might come and say, hey, I don't quite understand this. And, and somebody else might can kind of speak into that. And it's like, and then together, you're growing in the scriptures. Right now, my small group is going through the book of Galatians. And so we're reading this commentary, we're reading the word, and then we come together and we're discussing it, and it's just been awesome. I mean, uh, we, we kind of stopped last semester, we're picking it back up this semester, and just it's cool to be, begin to learn God's word and learn that book of Galatians, all right? And then if you really want to go to another dip, go to the Equip Seminar next Sunday night, right? Go to the Equip Seminar. The, it's an Equip Seminar. Here's the title of it. Uh, I believe it's How to Read My Bible. Like, you're going to learn so much about the Bible. Young people, you need to learn about the Bible. You need to know about the Bible because, listen, this is what's coming. In a couple years, those of you who are freshmen, sophomore, junior, senior, as soon as you get to be a freshman, here's what happens. Two-thirds of young people leave the church in the first semester of college because some dumb professor stands up and tells them that the Word of God is not true. And then they get in a circle of friends who say the same thing, and two-thirds of our young people are walking away from the church because they don't have a faith of their own when they get to college because they've just been told all this stuff, and it's the faith of their parents, faith of their grandma. Young people, get a Bible and get a faith of your own. Read the Bible on your own. You need to do it. And get one on your level that you can understand. So, so now we've taken several dips, have we not? And now this is what it means for the, to let the word of God to dwell in me richly. Right? I'm not just going to come to church once a week and listen to a sermon. Come on, you've got to take responsibility for your own salvation, for your own knowledge. And you've got to read, study Get in a small group and discuss. Go to a class. Learn about, fall in love with the Bible. So this, from this point forward, I want to kind of teach us what the Bible really is all about. Normally, this would probably take me about eight hours. I'm going to try to do it in 18 minutes and five seconds, okay? I'm going to be able to do it. I'm going to do it. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's going to do it. Just go ahead and tell him. He's going to do it. But the key to anything is, you know, is a relationship. Right? And if you want to have a relationship, you have to understand one another. Understanding is the key to a relationship. Isn't that true of your spouse? And the more that I understand Lauren, the more beautiful she becomes to me. The more our relationship develops, right? And I'm still, I mean, you, you know, I'm still trying to understand her, right? Like, I mean, it just kind of is what it is. It's like that man who came upon a treasure 
and he opened the treasure. He stumbled upon it and hiking, stumbles upon this treasure, and a genie comes out. And the genie's like, hey, you found me. You get one wish. What would you like for your one wish to be? And the guy was like, well, actually, I'm like really afraid of heights, and so I've never been out of the country. I've never flown anywhere, and so I've always wanted to go to Hawaii. Is there any way I can go to Hawaii? Can you, here's my wish. Can you build a bridge from California all the way to Hawaii so I can drive to Hawaii and see the beautiful landscape that God created? And the genie was like, do you know how hard that is? Like, do you know what that's going to take? you know how many miles of asphalt that's going to be? Do you know how many pillars we're going to have to put in the water? Do you know how, how much material that's going to take? Do you know how long this is going to take? Is there any way you have any other wish? And the guy was like, well, um, maybe you could help me understand my wife. To which the genie said, you want one lane or two lanes? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, don't send me an email, somebody. I had to, had to throw that in there, you know. I got to help my guys out every now and then, right? All right, here we go. But we got to understand God's word. So here, let me help you out with this, all right? This is going to give the Bible some credibility for you. And you're not going to be able to write this down, so just look at the screen. I want you to know it was written over a period of 1,600 years in over 12 countries on three continents by 40 people in three different languages. So think about all that over a period of 1,600 years. Years the Bible was written. Twelve countries, three continents, 40 people, three different languages. Now the Bible was written by poets, prophets, farmers, kings, soldiers, shepherds, princes, priests, historians, fishermen, tax collectors, scholars, businessmen, and doctors. And the Bible was written in caves, ships, palaces, prisons, and deserts. So, so here's my question. With all of that information right there, how the Bible is written in all of those specific places, how in the world did they come up with one story without contradiction? How did they come up with the same story? And here's the answer. It's because it was Holy Spirit breathed and there was only one author. And it's our Heavenly Father. He's the author of this story. There is no way what I just described, over 1,600 years, 40 different writers, there's no way that they could come together and write this beautiful story that's true, that has stood the test of time if it were not inspired by the Holy Spirit and, and truly is what God says it is, that it is alive and active as is the word of God. Second Timothy says it like this, all scripture is God-breathed. So all scripture through the penmanship of 40 writers, and all those people I talked about, all of it is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, and righteousness, so that the servant of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'm talking about every facet of your life. This helps you with your marriage, your children, your money, your time, wisdom, decision-making, rest, every part of your life. The Bible actually works because it's alive. So the reason I want the Bible to dwell in you richly is not just for Sunday, it's to equip you for every good work and every part of your life. So anytime I'm faced with a circumstance or situation, I go, what does God's word say about this? And I do it his way. And this is the foundation of my relationship with Jesus and the foundation of my marriage and my family and how I lead this church. Some people find the Bible hard to understand because of the way that it's grouped and really because it's not chronological. Like it's not really one of those Bibles that you kind of read from beginning to end and it's in order. And so there are actually out there what is called chronological Bibles that puts the Bible in order. Um, I've never read one of those, but I've heard they are awesome and probably need to do that in the future. But the Bible is a collection of 66 books And again, they're not organized, they're grouped, and they're not always grouped chronologically. So I just want to fly by, you know, this is just fly by really quick. Here's how the Bible is grouped. The first five books are law books. This is Genesis through Deuteronomy, okay? So that's the Torah, that's the first five books of the law. Then you get the 12 books that are history-based, that's Joshua through Esther. And then you get into what is poetic books. This is Job, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, there are five of those. 
After that, you get into the prophecy books, and you've got five major prophets. This is Isaiah through Daniel, and then you've got 12 minor prophets, Hosea through Malachi, right? And it's just, the reason why there's five is because, they're, and they're called major, is just because they're longer, all right? The 12 minor prophets are just smaller. That's it. Then you get 400 years of silence, no revelation from God. And then Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospels. Now, the Gospels are not four different stories. It's the same story told from four different perspectives and four different accounts. So if you want to know about Jesus, read the Gospels, and it'll tell you all about his ministry, and all about how he healed, he died, and he rose again for you. Then you get into how the church was established. This is the book of Acts. So this is the historical record of the first church. Now that the church is planted, now letters are being written through what is called the epistles. There are 21 of those. And in those 21 letters, this is how you begin to learn that, how to live your life. And so this is different churches writing letters, you know, or, or Paul writing letters to church, Timothy writing letters, right? And, and they're teaching the church and God's people how to live their life. And then we get the revelation, which is the prophecy of the last days and eternity. So you read all that and you're like, okay, that's a flyby. Like, I get that. That was kind of quick. But like, Matt, like, what, what is the Bible all about? Let me show you something that, um, that I found. I didn't come up with this. I'm not smart enough to come up with this, but I think it will be very helpful for you. It's called the plot, the mirror image, okay? And this is where the Old Testament and the New Testament actually mirror themselves. This is, don't try to write this down right now. You can go back and, and watch this. I really want you to lean into this and just see this, okay? You're not going to be able to write this down. I'm going to go too quick for you. But the Bible actually starts with God and righteous people in paradise, okay? This is Adam and Eve, all right? Everything was perfect. Everything was great. The next thing that happens is Satan and sin enter into the garden, enter into our lives through the sin of Adam and Eve. And chaos begins. Then God judges the world and he destroys the world through a flood. But he leaves Noah and his family to continue humanity. And as humanity continued to grow, they tried to set up a one world government. And this is where they, the Tower of Babel, they tried to build skyscrapers to to themselves, worship themselves, and they forgot about God. And so God tore that down by mixing their language up so that they couldn't understand one another. And that's where the Tower of Babel fell, the city fell, and God said, I'm going to set it up a little bit differently. I'm going to set it up through 12 tribes of Israel, God's holy people. So you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? God changes Jacob's name to Israel. So that's where we get the name of Israel, and, and God's holy people, when he calls them Israel, and through Jacob's 12 sons, he sets up 12 tribes, and that's God's holy people. The problem with that was there were a lot of external laws and rules and regulations, and there wasn't much heart change. And so then God sent Jesus, and I put Jesus at the top in the center because he's really what it's all about. Can I get an amen, somebody, right? But then you look at Jesus, and what did he do? He set up 12 disciples, and he set up the church, which is God's holy people. You see how it's starting to mirror. And then this is where we're heading right now. So this is where we are in the history of what's going on in the Bible and what it prophesies. We are headed. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying the Bible says it, prophesies it. It's going to happen no matter what we try to do. Eventually, there will be a one-world government because the Bible prophesies. And you can start to see how that's... Even through this like pandemic and how countries are like working together and, and like it's going to all come together and there's going to be a one world government system. And then God is going to judge the world again and destroy the world, this time not by a flood, but through fire. And at that point, Satan and sin are going to exit, but it won't be God and the righteous people, it'll be God and the redeemed people in paradise. This is what the Bible is all about. That right there. Yeah, I see some of you getting your phones out, taking a picture. You could do that if you want. Like, this is the flyby of the Bible. This is what's going to happen. 
That's why it's important for us to place our faith in Jesus. That's why it's important for us to live for him and tell everybody we know because God is going to judge the world again. We all will have a final exam with Jesus. So if the band wants to come on out, y'all can come on. So what is the Bible all about? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. John 5, 39 says this, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Now, look at that scripture. That is Jesus talking right there. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, they didn't have the New Testament. See, a lot of times we think the New Testament's all about Jesus, Old Testament's just about Israel and God's people, and Jesus comes on the scene. They don't have the New Testament yet. The only scriptures they have is the Old Testament. So throw that scripture back up on the screen. When he says this, he says, you search the scriptures. What scriptures is he talking about? The Old Testament, because that's all they had. The, you search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures, the Old Testament, it points to me. It all points to me. So when you open up this Bible... When you open up this Bible, you find Jesus, and the king is in the room when you open the Bible, and he meets with you every time. All you have, you, I, a lot of people are like, man, I'm lonely, I, I'm, I'm struggling. He's just waiting to meet you in your room. You just got to open it. The word that you need to live out your day is going to be found in the verse. You choose to either open or not open. I'm encouraging you, 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day. Come on, you can do it, right? 15 minutes a day, meet with Jesus. Let's meet with Jesus. He is what the Bible is about from beginning to end. It's how you find out about him. It's how you develop a relationship with him. And listen, I want to remind you, don't just read the Bible. Let the Bible read you. Okay? Before you open up God's word, don't do this number. Okay. Can the Holy Spirit use that? Sure. But you know what's more powerful? is before you open it, you say, God, I'm about to open up your word. You know what I need to read. You know what my heart needs to hear. And I'm just asking you to speak to me. Give me the word that I need for the day that I'm about to go live, that you're already present in. Jesus, would you come off the pages? Meet with me. You know, it's, I love reading the stories about Jesus and him feeding the 5,000 and him helping that adulterous woman. I mean, would you have loved to have just been there when he helped her up and all those people dropped the stones? He just loved her where she was. Like, wouldn't you love to have been there? And it's like God gives us a way to be there. You can be transmitted there through his holy Bible. So here's what we're going to do. I just want to take the next 10 minutes. I just want to focus on Jesus. I just want you to get your eyes fixed on Jesus. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to sing this song. And I just, this is a reflective moment, so we're not going to stand and sing. We're just, I just want you to reflect on Jesus and your relationship with him. And I hope that you are encouraged to find him in the pages of God's word. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word that is everlasting, that, that your word never fails. God, I thank you that we find Jesus in the pages. So God, I pray that our, just, our love for your word just continues to grow as this is the year of the Bible. And I pray that with every time we sit with you that we would fall more in love with your word in Jesus King Jesus come and meet with us we thank you that you're in the room every time we open it 
You don't have to be. But you love us so much that you meet us there. So we just, we love you. And we pray for this moment right here, God. Just do a work inside of us. Hearts and minds. Just as we sit and rest. You say, come to you, all who are weary and burdened, and heavy laden, and you will give us rest. The next 10 minutes, God, just pray for rest to fall on us. We fix our eyes on you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you so much for joining us today. We pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if it has, would you consider partnering with us financially? You can do that simply through giving through the Rescue House app or making a donation online at our website. And you too can be a part of helping others discover who God made them to be. And if today's message impacted you, would you share it with a friend or a family member? And lastly, if you're in the area, we would love to meet you in person. So join us next Sunday at our Moxville campus location. Now, go be who God made you to be.